This podcast is brought to you by the Islamic Center and NYU. For more information, visit our website at www.icnyu.org. The name of Allah, the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy and prayers and blessings be on his beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So today we're actually covering just number 16, which covers Surah Maryam and Surah Taha. And subhanAllah, out of all of the surahs in the Qur'an, these, are, these two in particular are some of the most musical surahs in the Qur'an. And, and when the, the music, like the rhythm of it changes, it is because the message changes and it's actually talking about something. And it's a means by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling our attention to something, which I think is really stunningly beautiful. But in talking about, so say, Surah Maryam is about Sayyidah Maryam, Lady Maryam, may Allah, uh, alayhi salam. And then Surah Taha is, the majority of it is about Sayyidina Musa, alayhi salam. And in both of these surahs, what's really interesting is you see how both Maryam and Musa, alayhi salam, people were using their names to put them down. And in these two surahs, Allah is using their names to lift them up. And I just always thought that was a really beautiful subtlety. We talked before about um, Surah Al-Imran, which is the th- third surah and is one of the longest surahs in the Quran. And it was kind of describing the situation before Sayyidah Maryam alayhi salam and how and why things came about the way that they did, the conversation that her mother was having with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the dua that she was making. Surah Maryam is the world a- according to Sayyidah Maryam alayhi salam and her impact on the community that she was in. So it actually begins not with Sayyidah Maryam alayhi salam, it begins with a really subtle, beautiful dua that Zakariya alayhi salam, Prophet Zechariah is making. He was like her, her protector, a, a mentor type person in the, when she was worshiping in, in, in the temple, subhanAllah. And he, it was part of his job to, to, to protect her. But you can see as he's making this dua, that he's actually making this dua. And we know from Surah Ali Amran that he made the dua because he was inspired by her. So part, what's beautiful about the surah is just talking about her impact. And what she was doing, and you can, one of the, how I was talking about how people were using her name to put her down. In ayah number 27, so the, the story of Sayyidah Maryam alayhi salam, of like the miraculous birth of Prophet Isa alayhi salam, she was sent to a people where gender specific levels of oppression were, were ingrained within their spiritual and religious tradition, which is very, very unfortunate. And it's something that can feel very destructive to people, which is why, subhanAllah, the angel comes to her and he's telling her that you're you're going to have this child. Surah Al-Tahrim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us there is an example for all believers. And one of the examples he mentions is Surah Maryam, that mentions um, the lady Prophet, Prophetess Maryam, may Allah alayhi salam. So we're talking about her but there is a moment, and it's a very, very human moment that she goes through, where the angel's telling her about this miracle that she is going to have, her child's going to be a messenger, and she knows what a community like this would do to a young woman that is coming back and saying, I have a, have a child, and this child is born of no fault. And it's a miracle, and She knows exactly what her community is going to put her through. And one of the reasons that she, above other women, were able to worship in the temple was because of her lineage. And you can see how, because of her lineage, like there's points where it actually in Ali Amran, it talks about how there was tension, how they were arguing about how they're going to handle the situation of Bani Malayi Salaam being being their worshiping. But what we know about her is all she did is she prayed all day and she fed the poor. And Allah showed her these miracles of she would always have food to give, she would always have food for herself and for others. And this was some of the miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave her. And yet when she dawns on her this idea that she needs to go back to her people, she has this moment and she says, Ya laytani mittu qabla hadha wa kuntu nasyan man siya. In ayah number 23, she says, if only I had died long before this moment and I was long forgotten. And unfortunately, some of the people of the tafsir say that it's like, oh, it's because she was fearing the pain of child labor. I want you to know women have had children and then thought, hey, let's do this again. So it wasn't a fear of physical pain. It was a fear of something that shook her to her core. 
may Allah protect us. And I also think that when we talk about like mental health and we talk about depression, there's a point of put, like someone feeling like everything about them is now about to be challenged. And it's a very difficult test. And when we see someone going through this, we should try to help them as much as we can, lift them up as much as we can. And we see how the Quran and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself is doing this for Sayyidina Maryam. So this is part of our prophetic tradition. This is part of our Islam to be lifting people up when they're going through difficulty. When someone's going through a difficulty and you'd be like, hey, just go pray more is, is ridiculous. It's just, it's like, it, it's, it's something that is hitting them at their core and they need to figure it out and they need support. And yes, prayer becomes a part of that, but it's not the only thing you're doing. You having that moment isn't because you didn't pray enough. You can't say that Maryam didn't pray enough. She prayed more than enough. She prayed a ton. And still she was going through this life-shifting event. And she comes, she has her child. And as soon as he is born, السلام, as soon as Isa السلام, is born, he starts immediately speaking to her and calming her and telling her, this is where you can find food. This is how you can, Allah has, has sent you a stream so you can drink. So calm yourself and don't respond back. Fast for, and this is one of the understandings of fasting is she fasted from speech for three days. So she comes back through the city and she's carrying her child and immediately they start using her name to insult her and they say, Ya Maryam, oh Maryam, you've done something horrible. Ya Ukhta Harun, and now they're like talking about her lineage and they're like, oh Harun's sister, your mother, was not a, a your your father was a good was not a horrible man and your mother would have never never done something like this actually subhanallah the the, the word that they use they actually they were slut shaming her they said your mother is <laughs> it's not a prostitute how dare you do this is essentially what they said to her and it's actually written in the quran and subhanallah that it's written in such a beautiful language that you can go through it and not realize just how vile what they were saying to her was and she points to the child and they didn't take a second of like, hey, all she does is feed the poor all day. Maybe she found an orphan child. None of that. They just immediately started attacking her. She points to the child again, before they have a second to breathe, they say, how can we speak to a child that, that is still in, um, a baby that doesn't, hasn't been given the ability to speak? And SubhanAllah Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam speaks. He affirms the, the miracle of his birth and he says, I am the servant of Allah. He has given me the book. He has made me a messenger. And I will always treat my mother well. I will always have my mother's back. And he is such a beautiful example of what male allyship should look like. I, from the very first moment, he says, I have my mother's back. Over and over in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls him Isa, Isa ibn Maryam, Isa the son of Mary. And he doesn't do this with other prophets, even if they have noble lineages. So he doesn't say, for example, Ismail ibn Ibrahim, even though his father is Ibrahim alayhi salam. It's not because his lineage wasn't significant, but it was because Isa and Maryam alayhi salam, they were, they, were, they were a team. They did this together. She changed the world to be able to receive Isa alayhi salam to begin with. And they're just, I really, really love this story, subhanAllah. I, the benefit of learning these stories and learning the stories of Prophets in general, they show us our capacity as human beings. Can women overcome religious, spiritual, gendered spiritual abuse? Yes, they can because Sayyidina Maryam alayhi salam did. And when we push back against gendered spiritual abuse, this is who's, we're standing on her shoulders. We're standing, we're walking in her footsteps alayhi salam. SubhanAllah. The, stu the surah is really beautiful. There's also a sajda. So inshallah, in the first, recit uh, first portion, Ismail's recitation will have a sajda. So just look out for that. And then it continues. And it, talk it talks about people who put, who put people down needlessly. And the reason it's important to talk about gender, when we get to surah Taha, Taha the surah is so beautiful at the beginning where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet sallallahu we have not given you this Quran so that it can be difficult for you it's here to lift you up sometimes we feel the weight of what we're doing and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is telling him it's like no this is to lift you up and it tells the story of Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam and immediately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says 
number 11, it says when he entered the valley, he went, went to the mountain of Lur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls him out and says, Ya Musa, O oh Musa. And you can see how again and again, Pharaoh keeps trying to break him down with his name. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps lifting him up. And he says, and I've chosen you for me. I have built you under my watchful eye to heal him. He also went through a, a gendered form of oppression, but it was, an, it was different because they were telling him that essentially he was someone to be feared. And all of the men of Bani Israel were to be feared. The women were to be t- dismissed, but the men were to be feared. And this is something that unfortunately I, I, America actually does to black boys starting from the fifth grade. That's actually the point where they start building, actually start building prisons based on how many black boys are in the fifth grade. This is part of the prison industrial complex. And alhamdulillah, I, I know that last week we had an incredible moment and I'm really grateful for it. And may Allah make it the beginning of a lot of change to come, but we still have a lot of work to do. And a lot of the things that Sayyidina Musa salam, went through are not very different from what a lot of people in our own community go through. And they go through regularly. SubhanAllah. Sayyidina Musa salam, and it's in this surah, like you can see him having a conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it begins the surah with that moment of him having that conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's mentioning how he's there with his wife. He's there with his family because him building a relationship, having a loving relationship was actually part of his own healing. And, and both surahs begin at the person's spiritual height. It tells you about their struggles, but it begins at their spiritual height and is telling us we can achieve this too. We can follow in their footsteps and be at such like have such spiritual strength that the worst enemy wouldn't be able to defeat us, wouldn't be able to break us. Wouldn't be able to break you inside. Subhanallah, I, I feel like it's interesting that Surah Maryam addresses gender. In Surah Taha, actually a lot of the, the, the oppression that, that Musa alayhi salam was going through was, was akin to like race relations because it was the Israelites versus the Egyptians. So part of it was, was racial injustice, but also part of it was, was fearing him as a man. And fearing him as a black man in particular, subhanAllah. And how he was not just only able to overcome that, but was able to thrive and become a leader for his people who was spiritually healed. The other thing that I think is really beautiful about this particular story is part of fighting this like unfortunate, like um, what do they call it? The, the, the toxic male masculinity is that him, he acknowledged he needed his brother. He just said, Ya Allah, grant me my brother. And that's what he asked. And I just think it's so beautiful, these teams of Sayyidina Isa and Maryam alayhi salam and Sayyidina Musa and Harun alayhi salam. And you can see how they both have a calming effect on each other. So when Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam gets angry, it's Harun alayhi salam that calms him down. And just the subtleties in their relationships are just really beautiful. Our love for each other can become healing. Our love in our families, between spouses, between siblings, between parent and child, Having these strong relationships can help heal us. May Allah allow us all to, to have this place of healing, allow us all to have these strong communities and accept, accept from all of us, subhanAllah, half of the month is wrong. May Allah accept the first half, fill the next half with barakah and make it the best Ramadan yet. Ameen. Jazakumullah khairan. Greetings, peace and blessings be upon you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Um, we are uh, in the 17th juz, the 17th section today. Um, I want to give a quick shout out to Dr. Amina Amina Darwish, who took over the past few days while um, I was away tending to, you know, a few things, of course, in the wake of my grandmother's passing. Um, I want to, uh, you know, I, and I want to say thank you to everyone who reached out with their duas, their well wishes, their love, their good vibes. Uh, that stuff really makes a difference, especially in COVID when you can't gather together. Um, and I lastly want to say if folks can keep my uh, mother in their thoughts and prayers. She actually just uh, arrived in Delhi a few hours ago. Shortly we'll be getting to Lucknow to finally be reunited with uh, her father, my Nana, with her two brothers. Um, and I know that'll be extremely impactful for her um, to be able to grieve with the rest of the family. And we, we pray, as, as everyone has seen, the situation in India is uh, extremely grim. 
Um, you know, I would suggest if people can, and of course there are always causes to donate, but in the month of Ramadan as the prophet, peace be upon him said, he would give during this month, like the wind. Um, and so if there's additional funds you have at your disposal, um, you can go to launchgood.com. They have a fundraiser up for orgs doing really solid work on the ground in India. Um, you can also search up equality labs. They have quite a few mutual aid organizations in India doing a lot of really good work, but, um, course it's it's a difficult time out there so we pray that Allah makes it easy for all those who are struggling we pray that uh, those who are uh, uh, responsible for the you know just um, completely disastrous government response are held to account um, because it's a shame you know what those leaders are putting their people through so we'll go ahead and get started this is juz 17 there are two surahs in this juz or in this section uh, you have surah al-anbiya the chapter entitled the prophets and then you have um, Surah Al-Hajj, uh, entitled the Hajj or the Pilgrimage. Um, I think what's neat about this chapter, this section, is that these two surahs, they sort of cover, you know, the entirety of Hijra, right? The entirety of the migration of the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, from Mecca when he was exiled and then going into Medina. So uh, Surah Anbiya, the first chapter, is revealed uh, at the end of the Prophet's time in Mecca, and Surah Hajj is essentially revealed for the most part at the beginning of the Prophet's time in Medina. Now, the Surah entitled The Prophets, of course, focuses on the larger themes, the oneness of God, the hereafter, the stories of past nations. Um, and there are a total of 16 prophets that are covered in Surah Al-Anbiya. Um, and so uh, there are a few things I want to touch upon, um, but I think it's, it's uh, quite telling. Just the first verse that you read of this chapter, the 21st chapter, where God Almighty says, uh, ever closer to people draws their reckoning, their hisab, their, uh, their, the day of accounting, uh, while they turn away heedless. Um, they turn away, you know, filled with ghafla, with, with heedlessness. Um, and, and if there's one thing that has really shaken me to my core with my grandmother's passing, it's been that uh, literally anything and everything uh, in this life can go in a matter of an instant. Uh, it doesn't matter how much you know, you see in terms of the perceived reality of them being healthy or well or safe or what have you, uh, the day of accounting is approaching rapidly for anyone and everyone. Um, and as Allah says in a different part of the Quran, um, it's coming, it's as near as the blink of an eye, if not nearer. Um, so it's a reality check for, for us when it comes to taking account of our actions um, and understanding what we need to rectify within our own lives, um, be it uh, the challenges or struggles within ourselves or the, the, the um, amends that need, have to, need to be made with other people. Um, so the first story I wanna focus on in uh, this surah uh, is the story of Ibrahim Sam, the prophet Abraham, uh, and um, you know, the focus uh, that he has on God being fully sufficient for him. Um, so you'll see this entire exchange in verses 59 to 67, uh, but essentially, you know, just to give a brief overview as a lot sort of, uh, describes and, and tells in this, in this part of the surah, Ibrahim Rais, um, like many other prophets, the prophet Abraham comes to his people, emphasizes this notion of the oneness of God. You can't ascribe uh, other partners to God, that there is no source of healing. There is no source of strength except with God. The people are resistant primarily because uh, this would also mean a shift in terms of how society is structured, in terms of who's given power, um, in terms of how things are allocated, right? And who has to give up their clout and their agency. Um, and so there comes a story as it's described in these verses where um, the people are described as having left, leaving the town for a festival. Uh, the prophet Abraham carries an ax to a temple and basically destroys all the idols in the temple. Um, and this is something that he resorts to after spending immense amounts of time trying to warn in other ways. And so he takes more drastic measures, destroys all the, uh, the, uh, the, the idols in the temple, except one, the biggest one, and hangs his ax around that neck. The folks come back and they ask, you know, is, you know, who has done this? Some people say it's Abraham. They say, are you the one who has done this to our gods, O Abraham? Abraham says, nope, it was the biggest statue. Look, the ax is around him, go ask him. And of course, these people, they turn to themselves and they say, indeed, Abraham knows well that these idols don't speak. And then Abraham says, do you then worship besides God, things that can neither profit you nor harm you? Now, instead of sort of, you know, taking a step back and thinking, hey, there's a serious underlying message here, um, these people become even more vehement in their opposition to Abraham. What's then described is that they ordered all the citizens to gather firewood. They built this immense fire um, and 
Uh, they promised people that anyone who assisted in creating this fire would be healed of any sickness, right? But they built such a fire so high that the birds could not fly overhead um, and so large that Abraham had to be catapulted into the flames. And this was the sort of hate that they had towards this man, that they said, if we're really going to take him out, we got to just fully burn him in this pit. And so then comes uh, the story where the uh, prophet Abraham is being thrown and launched into the fire. And as he's being thrown into the fire, the angel Gabriel comes down and asks, yeah, Ibrahim, do you need any help? And the angel of rain also separately requests permission of God to pour down rain to extinguish the fire. There's almost a sense of panic amongst the angels that a prophet of God is, uh, you know, being thrown and hurled to his death. And when Ibrahim is asked if he needs anything, he responds and he says, Hasbun Allahu wa ni'mal wakil. He says, indeed, Allah is sufficient for me, sufficient for us. He's the best disposer, the best orchestrator of our affairs. And so Allah then commands the fire, as is read in this chapter, Ya Nabukuni Bardon wa salaman ala Ibrahim, O fire be coolness and safety upon Abraham. And Allah says, and they intended for him harm, and we made them the greatest losers. And I think about this story and I think about Abraham, uh, you know, rapidly approaching this fire that is a clear physical danger. It's an imminent danger. And he gets to a point where he recognizes that everything that he's done, he's done to the best of his ability as much as he could. And that the ultimate disposer of his, of his affairs is God. And at that point, he turns away the angels saying sufficient is God right? He's the best disposer of my affairs. Is this, if this is my end and this is my outcome, I know I put my best foot forward. I know I did what was in within my capacity and this pain or whatever comes my way, I trust in God, right? That this is ultimately the best of outcomes or the best of fates for myself. And I think this is something for us to just think about is the anxiety and the worry, the things that may plague our hearts, the things that appear like the fire to Abraham, imminent danger, uh, immediate danger. Uh, how reassured are our hearts in knowing that at the end of the day, whatever may afflict us, whatever trial may come our way, it is ultimately one that is decreed by the one who is the most merciful, those who show mercy. And how reassured are we getting to the station of Abraham that if we really put forward our best effort in striving to do what we can in this life, that ultimately whatever happens is for the best because decreed by none other than the one who knows our circumstance and our condition more intimately than anything or anyone else in this world. And this was something too, just thinking about my grandmother is the loss of her, right? As difficult as that is in the moment, I found so much blessing and knowing that I had the chance to overlap with her in such a way that my heart could be touched by hers. And the loss is difficult, but the greater sort of zooming out is recognizing the gratitude of knowing this was what was given to me and I was blessed with. When it is taken from me, it is for God's to keep, for ultimately it was his to begin with. Uh, it takes time to come to terms with that, but that gives you the solace that none of your affairs are decreed except by the one who is the ultimate disposer of affairs, the one who says he is as-salam, the source of peace, the one who says he is al wadud the source of love. Uh, that conviction and connection to God above all else is extremely important to maintain. Also in this chapter, uh, there are several other stories. I'll focus on the story of Jonah, Yunus alayhi salam. Uh, this is a story of the prophet Jonah who was also sent down to his people, tried to warn them, tried to really push them to, to reorient themselves towards uh, 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 the one God towards God himself. Uh, they rejected him. He got fed up, basically turned around and said, I quit on this mission of being a prophet. We know the story. He's out on a boat, gets swallowed by a whale. And in the depth of the darkness of the night, at the bottom of the ocean, in the belly of the whale, the prophet Eunice recognizes where he messed up, that he turned his back on his people. He gave up on them in a way that was uh, sort of giving up on the task and the mission and the purpose that God given to him. And the statement that he makes, as is written in this chapter of the Quran, Yunus, in that period of regret and remorse, he says, La ilaha illa anta subhanak inni kuntu min al Ya Allah, there is none. Uh, he says, There's no deity or object worthy of worship except you. Uh, you are glorified above all deficiencies, and verily I'm amongst those who have done wrong. And the scholars, they commentate how beautiful this, uh, this uh, call out to, to God is because Jonah doesn't ask to be saved. 
He doesn't ask to be returned back to his people. He doesn't ask or beseech him for a specific request. He simply says, I'm sorry. He simply apologizes to his creator. And it is with that apology that God restores back his station with his people, returns him back to his community, grants him elevated success and honor. And sometimes when it comes to both our relationship with God and then also, especially with our relationship with people, it's sometimes a matter of just saying you're sorry, that you just apologize, no matter how much it hurts the ego, no matter how difficult it is to just text it, to write it, to speak it, to say it, that I'm sorry. Because the process of sort of amending those broken ties will inevitably start playing out when one is able to uh, uh, humble themselves and acknowledge that I messed up, right? It's not hard to then figure out, all right, what are we trying to do when one is able to apologize? Because then the receiving party knows, all right, this person is serious. They know they messed up and they want to be better and do better. All of that is intrinsic when one apologizes sincerely. And so we see that beautifully laid out uh, in the life of Yunus Ali Salaam. Uh, the next chapter is a ha- chapter that's sort of entitled Surat so al-Hajj, titled The Pilgrimage. So this was largely revealed in the beginning phase of Mecca, right after the Prophet migrated from Mecca to Medina. Um, and there's a, a powerful verse, uh, verse 11, chapter 22, where God says, there are also some who serve God with unsteady faith on an edge. If something good comes their way, they are satisfied. But if they are tested, they revert to their old ways, losing both this world and the next this is the clearest loss. And this idea of uh, worshiping or serving God on an edge, on the brink, it's meant to be that they're always in a state of doubt. And the scholars that talk about how there were Bedouins who used to accept the faith of Islam and then come home. And if their uh, you know, spouse had given birth or if their animals gave birth and they saw it as a good omen and they said, verily Islam is good for us. And if they didn't receive anything good, then they basically left Islam being there's nothing good in it for us. Uh, and this emphasizes, right? the type of relationship we're supposed to have with faith and ultimately with God, that it is not tied to the good or the bad that we received. And I actually found this, find this extremely empowering. You don't market this faith to someone, or you don't market this faith to someone who's struggling with faith by saying, Hey, if you do X, Y, and Z, you're guaranteed success in this life. When it comes to success, I'm describing material success. You're guaranteed wealth. You're guaranteed prosperity. No, The true success, as the prophet describes, the true wealth is the wealth of the soul. In building out that relationship with God, you are guaranteed a type of success in that your heart will acquire a new level of contentment, a new sense of tranquility, a deeper and more profound understanding of the reality of this life, such that the ups and downs don't shake you as much. You're not shaken when something extremely difficult happens. It's not to say that you can be sad, but you don't break that connection with God over it. And in the same way, when something extremely good happens to you, you don't just accept it as, hey, this is what I did, what I earned, but rather I've been blessed by God. Now that I've been given this additional blessing or bounty, how am I spending it in his way? Because I will be held accountable for it in the life to come. This is the type of relationship we are meant to build. It's not meant to be hinged upon the good and bad that comes our way. And this is difficult. This takes years of spiritual process, lifetime, basically, of spiritual process and purification Uh, to really grasp and understand that God is there through the ups and downs, but the ups and downs should not determine whether or not we worship or recognize or acknowledge uh, the authority and the mercy and the ultimate uh, uh, kingdom uh, that is the kingdom of God. Uh, And the last thing I'll add uh, before we end is uh, verse 73. This is towards the end of Surah Al-Hajj where Allah says, people here is an illustration, so listen carefully. Those you call on beside God could not, even if they combined all their forces, create a fly. And if a fly took something away from them, they would not be able to retrieve it. How feeble are the petitioners and how feeble are those they petition? Even as something as small as a fly and the way the, the body of a fly is created, constructed, is able to sustain itself, Uh, That can never be created by creation. And this is a challenge by God Almighty himself. And it's meant to humble us in recognizing how little do we truly know about the creation of the creator. Uh, And that no matter how much we want to claim of advancements and of capacity and intellect, uh, there are things we cannot transcend because there's always that, that, that difference between how we can perform and behave as creation and ultimately what miracles exist with God and God alone. 
So with that, I'll go ahead and end. Jazakum al khair. In the name of Allah, the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy and prayers and blessings be on his beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu So we're on just number 18. It's hard to believe we have got this far, subhanAllah, through the month. Um, just number 18 has two full surahs, Surah Al-Munun, Surah number 23, Surah Al-Nur, the, the chap, uh, surah called The Light, number 24, and number the beginning of number 25, but we'll probably, we'll cover the majority of 25 tomorrow, inshallah, so we'll leave that for tomorrow. Um, there was a moment where people went to, a, a few of the companions went to the mother of the believers, Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha, and subhanAllah, the mothers of the believers, we talk about them as, we don't always give them their due. But when, when you lose a parent, you tend to rely on the other parent more. And after the passing of the Prophet Sallallahu the mothers of the believers created the sense of stability for the Ummah and, and, and were, were that presence where people could still see people going in and out of the house of the Prophet Sallallahu and, and felt like there, there was still life there and there was still movement and created a sense of continuity for the Ummah that was really critical and really the most difficult thing that the Ummah had ever been through. But anyways, the mother of the believers, mother of the believers, say that Aisha radiallahu anha, may Allah be pleased with her. Some of the companions went to her and they asked her, tell us about the character of the Prophet And she said, Kana his, his, his character was the Qur'an. Kana Qur'an and Yamshi. He was, he was the Qur'an walking. He was the personification of the Qur'an. When the Qur'an talks about ethics and morals and what we're supposed to do and, and embodying the lessons that we learn from the stories and all of that, the Prophet ﷺ was the personification of that. And, and, in, and subhanAllah, it's a very human endeavor. Part of the reason we follow the Prophets, may Allah be pleased with all of them, is that they were human beings. And that they, they, they had the same emotions as us. They had the same physical structures as us. They were, exa- they, they were like us in their humanity. And that's why we are able to follow their example. May Allah be pleased with all of them. But she also would indicate the first 10 ayat of Surah Al-Mu'minun that we're going to recite today. And the first ayah begins and it says, the believers have succeeded. And when we talk about success in... Unfortunately, now in our society, sometimes when they say so-and-so is so successful, it means that they've made a lot of money. They have a lot of material wealth, regardless of whether, say, their family is, is, is in, also in good shape, whether their community is in good shape. Success for us seems to be a personal comp- like accumulation of wealth instead of, am I good and are mine good? Are my people okay? Is my community okay? And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying the believers have succeeded. And these are the 10 ayat that when they asked Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha about the character of the Prophet ﷺ, she indicated these 10 ayat when it says that they are humble in their prayers, they're very, they're, they, their prayers aren't, like they're present in them. And they have an awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their prayers. They don't, do, they don't engage in idle talk, they, they pay their zakah. Actually, it says that they, they do their zakah, which I think is really beautiful. It's more than just giving it. It's actually making sure it gets to the right place. SubhanAllah. Yes, Sri Latifa saying Ramadan is flying by and Allah, may Allah accept it from us. And it says those who protect their private parts except from, from, from their spouses, those who are lawful to them, for them, they will not, this is what's lawful for them. Whoever transgresses against that, those are the ones who transgress. And those who are actually keep the trust that they have been given, they protect the, their trust, they protect the people they are entrusted with, and they protect the material possessions that they are entrusted with. And then again, they maintain their prayers. So it begins with prayers and it ends with prayers. And the, the last part, it says, those are the ones who inherit. They inherit the highest level of Jannah and they will live in it eternally, subhanAllah. I just thought it was so beautiful how this was the description of the character of the Prophet Sallallahu summarized so beautifully in 10 ayat. May Allah allow us all to be like them. And even when the verses were revealed, the Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever encompasses these things, they will be promised paradise. As was mentioned in ayah number 10, those are the ones who inherit. And ayah number 11, it says they are the ones that inherit the, the highest level of Jannah. For those is the highest level. Then it begins talking about the human being and it brings us back to our most foundational form, how we are created from the earth. We are created from a single 
single cell from a single clot, and then it goes through the formation of embryology. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, then we created you in a different form, and then you pass away. And when you look at someone's, when you look at tombstones, or when they write about someone who passed, or you check someone's like a, a famous person's Wikipedia page or whatever, they write the year they were born, they put a little dash, and then the year that they passed away. And that little dash, that encompasses everything that is our lives, subhanAllah. And in the surah, it mentions a number of times just how quickly this goes by. It mentions the story of Prophet Nuh, peace be upon him. And then it mentions some of the, the, the tafsir. They say that there, it's mentioning Hud, but it's actually not specifically mentioning Hud, alayhi salam. It could be. But it's saying, and then we kept sending all of the diff these different prophets, one after the other, and people had very similar reactions. And in one ayah, in ayah number 36, they say, hayhata, hayhata lima How far, how far is this thing that you've been promised? Life after death, how long of our lives? That's an entire lifetime. SubhanAllah, our lifetimes are actually very short. Relative to what is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's very, very small. And there's, um, we're almost upon the last 10 nights. Inshallah, Sunday is the first of the, the last 10 nights, the odd number, 10 nights. We need to be very vigilant to be looking for getting ourselves ready to look for Laylatul Qadr, Laylatul Qadr. The worship of it is equivalent to the worship of a lifetime. So if you think a lifetime is not that long, be very, very focused in the last 10 days to try to find that Laylatul Qad, try to do at least a little bit of as many, diversify your good deeds as much as you can. Give a little bit of charity every night. If you don't have a lot of money, that's fine. A dollar a day is $10 by the end of the 10 nights. It's not that much. But for a lifetime, you will have been giving a dollar every single day. You'll be praying two rakahs every single day. But whatever recitation you can do, whatever dua you can do, whatever goodness, whatever support you can give to other people. SubhanAllah, may Allah, may Allah allow us to get to Laylatul Qadr, witness it and, and accept it from us. Um, SubhanAllah mentions a string of ayat and then it goes to and then it ends with Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam. And again, it's saying that they're similar what all the responses that people gave. And in ayah number 52, it says that this is your ummah. It is one ummah. And Allah says, and I am lo your Lord, so be mindful of me. We don't separate between the prophets. We're following the prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he's the culmination of prophethood. But we learn from all of the prophets that have come before. We don't, we claim them just as much as we claim anything else. And we hope to be joined with them on the day of judgment in Jannah and just be with them because we are part of their ummah just as much as we are part of every the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ. We are all one ummah, those who want, believe in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, in ayah number 60, it says, those who get, do what they do and their hearts are, are trembling that they might return to their Lord. And I just, I really love this ayah because people that are actually connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala aren't going around boasting. If Allah gifts you an act of worship or Allah gifts you that the night of power, Laylatul Qadr, this isn't something to boast about. This is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We accept the gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with humility. And they were people that went, that come on the day of judgment, may Allah protect us. And they come and they, they argue. And then subhanAllah, the, the ayah saying, they, they said towards the end, and it says, um, sorry, let me pull up. The ayah. In ayah 106, it says, on the day of judgment, they go complain to Allah and they said, you know, we just, our lives took us. We just got so busy. And if you wonder what is taking your whole life, what is making you so busy? And it's not to say that we don't pursue things in our lives. We do, but we still do it with the right intention. If you are feeding your family, do it with the intention of, of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that's what he asked you to do. So saying that it's about time, we don't, we just got too busy and we didn't have time. We keep getting stuck in these races, the, this rat race. Stop the rat race. Focus on why you are there. SubhanAllah. And they go complain to Allah and they said, we just got so busy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, there were a group of people that were praising me and you mocked them for it. So it's not that you didn't know. You did know. You were mocking those who were actually praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The surah ends, ayah number, towards the end, it says, ayah number 15, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do you think we have created you for nothing? Just for, with no purpose, and that you won't be returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So glory be to Allah, the true king. 
There is no God but him. He is He is the Lord of He is the Lord of the great throne. SubhanAllah. Whoever SubhanAllah. We were created with purpose. And that's why we're here. And it's to recognize our purpose. So I'm I'm just being mindful of the time. Surah to Nur, we'll go through it quickly. Um it has a number of of, th- uh, of specific rulings, and a lot of it has to do with family relationships. How do you maintain family relationships in terms of like what is what is permissible and what is not permissible in terms of physical relationships? If you're with someone and you're refusing to commit to them, you're essentially telling them you're good enough for now, but you won't be good enough for me later. And you are part of the material world, and this is something that I'm using and then something that I'm moving on from, instead of actually giving it the sanctity that it deserves. Within a a committed married relationship, because that's what marriage is, it is essentially two people taking an oath in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in front of everyone that they know, saying, this person's now my family. That is what marriage is. SubhanAllah. It is just that level of commitment. And within a, within a committed relationship, this is something you actually get rewarded for, subhanAllah, which I think is so incredibly beautiful. There, um, in ayah number 11, it tells the story of a, a point where they accused our mother, Aisha, عنه, who we had mentioned earlier, and they accused her of infidelity. And I just want to point out, they didn't come out and say it right out. They first said, like, hmm, we saw her with somebody. Hmm, what about this? And they kept spinning this lie because a lot of the times what it takes to hurt someone's reputation isn't to just come out and attack them. It's to create enough of like doubt around them. And the Quran was revealed that exonerated her. And the reason this is so important is if Aisha radiallahu couldn't defend herself, none of us can. If Maryam alayhi salam was attacked, none of us can. These women that they were attacking, what did they do besides they were teachers in the community? They, they, they <laughs> lived, lived in worship, fed people, gave sadaqah. All they were doing was learning the, the, our religion, teaching it, living it out. And yet they are still getting attacked. And the reason, like we have, it is literally haram in our religion for you to attack someone's dignity for you to, for you to attack their reputation you have no right you have no right to out someone and this is to say that this isn't just if they're innocent in this case these women were innocent even if people aren't innocent you have no right to speak about it because you're closing the door of, of Telba in their return they're going to insist and be like and so what subhanallah why why are, like, I don't understand the point where we became more obsessed with other people's sins over our own. It's spiritual malice to be more obsessed with people, other people's spiritual well-being over your own. You are only responsible for yourself. We give advice to others. We love others. We help others as much as we can. But ultimately, we are responsible for ourselves, and we need to be correcting ourselves. May Allah allow us to become those who, like, who can do that. I have one minute. Ayah number 35 is the most beautiful ayah in this surah, and it says Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. And it goes into detail, the example of his light, subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is light upon light. The next ayah, it says they are in houses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed for them to be erected because people love to worship there. He's talking about the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to be places of lights for us. May Allah continue to shower us with his blessings and with his light. I mean, I'm, it's, I'm at the half hour. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamualaikum. All righty, greetings. Peace and blessings be upon you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. We'll go ahead and get started. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillahi wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. We start in the name of God, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. We ask that he send his peace and his blessings upon our master Muhammad. Uh, his companions, uh, and those who choose to follow him until the last day. Uh, So this is uh, section 19, Juz 19 of the Quran. Um, Dr. Amina had started, um, I don't know if she actually got into it, but the beginning of this section uh, finishes up the surah entitled Al-Furqan, the criterion, uh, and then it continues with the chapter of the surah entitled Ash-Shu'ara, the poets. Um, So to go into Furqan first, um, this was a surah that was uh, revealed in Mecca, uh, and this was around the same time uh, that the surah Al-Mu'minun, which is in the 18th section or the 18th juz, was revealed. 
Um, and this was basically at a time where there was um, it was at the peak of a famine uh, in the region uh, in which Mecca was in. Um, and the friction between the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, uh, and the leaders of the Quraysh of that society um, started to begin, but the actual full out persecution did not occur. Um, and what you'll notice in this chapter of Furqan is there's plenty of mention uh, of the attributes of God to help center the understanding of who God Almighty is uh, for the Quraysh, who did not want to accept the idea of there being one God um, you know, to submit to. Uh, so just a few verses to focus on here. For one, I wanted to talk about uh, verse 43. Uh, and this is where uh, God Almighty, he asks the prophet um, and basically kind of poses as a scenario to him. He says, uh, think of the man who has taken as his or own passion uh, as a God. They've taken their hawa as a God, as an object of worship. Are you to be his guardian? Do you think that most of them hear or understand? They are just like cattle. No, they are further from the path. So God describes and talks about the people who as their object of worship, as their sort of ultimate guiding light is their whims, their desires, uh, their sort of fleeting inclinations. And then he says beautifully, uh, do you think that most of them hear or understand they are just like cattle? No, they are further from the path. And the scholars, they commentate on this, um, talking about how uh, animals in general, right, will typically know when something is dangerous for them. If there is a fire or some sort of imminent threat within their vicinity, uh, the animals will run away from whatever that is, right? They're not going to run towards what's going to harm them. Uh, what's unique and kind of complex about humans is that when something harms us, our hawa, our desires could be the very thing that leads us deeper into that harm or that thing that damages our souls. Um, I think a perfect baseline example is, right, you're breaking your fast, you got plenty of food out. The momentary, you know, satisfaction can come from like fully stuffing your face and your stomach uh, and going all the way in. But what that'll do is very quickly thereafter, not even maybe like an hour, you'll feel the effects, the burden, the pain on the stomach, on the body of over, you know, satiating yourself and over consumption. And so here Allah is, is, is making it clear that as much as there is the inclination that we have where our hearts get tight, you know, tugged in different directions, if we use that as our sort of guiding compass uh, we're basically going to ruin ourselves in that there are times where what we want in the moment is not going to be what's good for us. Um, and this is why there was a person who posed the question to Shakespeare Webb saying, you know, I'm not really feeling that sort of feeling I get in, in practicing Islam. I lost that feeling. How do I get that feeling back? And he says so beautifully, he says, Islam is not about worshiping a feeling. Like we're not chasing after a sensation that every single time there's going to be the spiritual high. There is the discipline and the consistency that helps shape our souls in a way where we can uh, 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 overcome those periods where something momentary is pulling at our hearts, but we know it's not going to be good for us. And that's why the prophet, so I said him, he says that the heart is like a feather uh, floating in the wind and that it's constantly turning. And unless there's something to ground it, something as simple as the daily prayers, uh, those whims and those desires could be the very means by which we're uh, made more you know, a heedless of God or become less mindful of him uh, and may also end up hurting ourselves as well. Uh, later on in this chapter, towards the end, the last 10 verses speak about the uh, attributes or the traits of the servants of mercy, or ibadul rahman. And Allah Azza wa he says, well, ibadul rahman, the servants of the Lord of mercy are those who walk humbly on the earth and who, when the foolish address them, reply peace. And then there are several verses further describing the attributes of the servants of Al-Rahman, the servants of the most merciful. And I thought that first line about walking humbly on the earth is, is beautiful because uh, in it intrinsically is the understanding that there is a sense of humility and how we consume, tread upon, walk upon, interact with this earth, right? You humbly tread upon the earth, that your impact uh, it is not to the point where the earth itself is being damaged or exploited as a result of you being there. Um, and, and I think we spoke about this before. What Islam will push us to do is add sanctity and value to the things that are otherwise mundane. I've provided this example before that like, 
if we let uh, kind of the natural forces of human inclination sort of direct how we should behave, uh, it's going to lead to the exact things like the exploitation of the earth. Perfect example is uh, when you go to Dunkin' Donuts, for example, uh, and you order like an egg and cheese, right? What they'll do is they'll wrap it in that sort of food wrapper and then place it into a paper bag. And for most of us, the very first thing we'll do is we'll take it out of the paper bag and literally toss the paper bag. If you recycle it, that's great. But still, the utility of that paper bag is not even 10 seconds. But if we're thinking about what does it mean to humbly tread upon the earth, things like that should concern us and at least push us to think, how can we at least consume differently for ourselves and not simply go in alignment with how the rest of the world or what these natural forces of human desire for power and excess will lead us to do and lead us to become. Um, and, and beautifully after that first verse where Allah says, and when the foolish address them, they reply uh, with peace, uh, and then he says, they, they spend the night in worship. Uh, 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 that they spend the night in sajda, in prostration, uh, in standing, worshiping their Lord. And so how integral is our worship uh, as a way of defining us as servants of the most merciful? And um, I love to just make this point as, as it was made to me by my teachers is we have to really see prayer as a form of protest. Because the moment your heart can pull away actively and when it wants to from the shackles of this world and from the things that will call our heart constantly and consistently in ways that are distracting and alluring and, and sometimes just weighing us down, the moment we build that agency of the heart, the moment we're no longer tied to what other things or other people are going to want us to say or do. Um, and so that ability to build out worship in our schedule um, is a form of protest and a form of fortifying the heart. The last portion of this chapter uh, of, of this surah is uh, talking about those who repent. So Allah Azza wa Jal, Azza wa Jal describes uh, the folks who will arrogantly disregard the message, knowing it's the truth, and then describes those who uh, repent. And it says, except for those who, in verse 70, those who repent, believe, and do good deeds, God will change the evil deeds of such a person into good ones. He is most forgiving, most merciful. And I think it's important to stop here and think about what does it mean to not only be forgiven for the things that we may have done that harmed ourselves or harmed others, but for God to say that the amount of what you did that was wrong, the entirety of that amount will be converted into that same amount in good and righteous works and deeds for yourself. And we have to honestly believe in, in, the, in the quest of bettering ourselves through this faith uh, that at the end of the day, it is a Lord of mercy that is looking to uplift us above anything else. There's a beautiful hadith that I think about where the prophet tells us, so I sent him, this is in the books of Bukhari and Muslim, um, you know, the story of that man, right, who he had killed 99 people, starts to feel some remorse, which is insane. I'm like, 99 people, bro. Anyway, kills 99 people goes to the most learned of people and asks him, can I repent? Can I, can I improve myself after doing all this wrong? And that person basically says, no, there's no repentance or way of turning back for you. And that man kills that person, becomes a hundred. Then he goes to this other scholar and he says to him, hey, can I repent from what I did? I literally killed a hundred people. How do I fix this? Um, and that person says, go to such and such land, leave the evil uh, place that you came from, the company that you were in and go to this new land and commit yourself uh, uh, to bettering yourself to the worship of one God. Um, and, and that was the advice that he was given. This man starts going out to this new land and dies on the way there. And the angels come down. There are the angels of mercy um, and the, the angels of, of, uh, of hell that basically come down. And uh, basically there's a debate as to saying, well, this man really do, didn't do anything good. So he should be destined for punishment. And the angels of mercy say, well, the intention was that he wanted to do good and was killed before he could get there. And so another angel comes down and it's commanded that they should measure the distance between where he was between the previous land of evil uh, and the new land where he was intending to do good. And it ended up becoming apparent that he was slightly closer to the land of good. And so the angels of mercy took him. And so again, this faith is focused on the baby steps of progression. As small as that change is that we make, the end of the day, the focus is not on the ultimate achievements or accomplishments, but the progression and the attempts that we've made to strive uh, in making those types of changes. Um, so this is, you know, really focusing on the idea of Al-Rahman. Uh, this is the next chapter now, the next surah, Surah Al-Shu'ara, entitled The Poets. 
This was also revealed in the Meccan phase, the earlier period of prophethood. Um, and this really starts to, 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 to focus on um, a lot of the poets who existed at the time of Mecca. Poetry was a big thing, a huge oral tradition in Meccan society. Um, and one of the biggest stories we'll see focused here uh, is the story of uh, the, the uh, magicians who tried to challenge Moses. And when Moses uh, obviously drops uh, his stick uh, and it turns into what was like a serpent, the magicians immediately knew that we know our craft and our mastery of magic and what that man just put forth is not magic. And so they immediately submitted uh, to the message of Musa alayhi salam, Moses peace be upon him. So in the same way, there were so many instances when the verses of the Quran were being revealed where the poets at that time knew internally, this is not poetry that the prophet is, is putting forth from God. This is something else. The question is, uh, uh, in the face of recognizing the truth, is the heart willing to change and let go of some of the comfort and ease that it has to ascribe and commit to that truth? And so this is where Allah Azza wa is pushing these poets to think about if you recognize and know the truth, how willing are you to then change yourself as a result of it or remain in your ways, uh, in your ways arrogantly, not wanting to give up, uh, you know, the comfort or the privilege that you may have, um, you know, as a result of that. So a couple things in here. Uh, for one, Allah Azza wa provides the methodology for the Prophet, peace be upon him, where he says in verse 214, and warn your nearest of kin, that before we can truly impact a community or a society, uh, the greatest impact that we can have in our faith tradition starts with the family, starts with the people in your home. And that's why the best form of sadaqah, the best form of charity, is the one that you invest upon in your family, right? As the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, tells us. Um, and so there's hikmah, there's wisdom in that, uh, that the family and, and the people closest to us uh, should be the, the, the sort of um, people that we invest in the most, right? In building out what is within our immediate sort of control before we try to branch out and focus on, uh, you know, bigger issues at hand. Um, we got two minutes left. Okay, I'm going to focus on this one section. This is Ibrahim Raisam, the prophet Abraham, speaking to uh, the uh, people of his time. And he's describing who God is to him, uh, to the people, right? Describing his relationship with God. And this is in verse 77. Uh, the prophet Abraham says uh, that Allah fa'innam adu illa rabbal alameen, that the, the, the Lord of the universe is the one who indeed created me. It is he who guides me, who gives me food and drink, who cures me when I'm ill, who will make me die and then give me life again. And he who will, I hope, forgive my faults on the day of judgment. What I find powerful about this is Abraham's first description of who God is, is. He says that he's the one who created me and guides me, gives me food and drink and cures me when I'm ill. Right? There is uh, 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 an intrinsic understanding in, God's, uh, in, in Abraham's existence in this world that everything he is given in terms of nourishment, healing, support comes from God and God alone. And, um, you know, this is where Jafar Sadiq uh, says that God is the one who feeds and nourishes the soul and the body, uh, where the scholar says, when I'm ill through sin, he heals me with repentance. Now, the reason why I want to focus on this, these verses is because our understanding of God sometimes gets compartmentalized into, okay, he saved me from this calamity, he gave me this good, but our day-to-day -day in terms of uh, our clothing, our nourishment, uh, just all the comfort that we have, sometimes it gets disconnected from the fact that it is being given to us by the one who is al-Razak, the sustainer of all. And I can tell you for a fact for myself that the moments of fragility and weakness, when what we consider to be stable and permanent is stripped from us, that is when we actually recognize that our moment-to-moment -moment existence is sustained by God. And I think about when my grandmother passed away, I mean, Allah, your hamdulillah, may Allah have mercy on her, it was within three weeks that she went from being fully healthy to out of this world. And it is that kind of uh, 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 annihilation of the bounty and blessings that we have, those moments of struggle that make us most cognizant of what truly remains stable through all that. And the only thing at the end of the day that you end up realizing you can rely upon uh, is the, 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 uh, the blessing and what God provides to us, right? But the moment we get used to certain blessings, we become heedless of the fact that they're being given to us, ordained by God on a moment to moment basis, the quicker we then lose track and lose sight of the presence of the divine in our day-to-day -day affairs. 
Uh, and I think a lot about this when it comes to uh, just the, the dissemination of vaccines in this country and the distribution of vaccines. There is a clear, there's clear inequities that exist within this country and within the world as to who does and doesn't get the vaccine. And sometimes it can feel that, hey, I'm in this country. Yeah, this is sort of something that we should be entitled to that because of the, the, the production capacity and capabilities of this country, we can just get the vaccine. Whereas in places like India, like you're just not gonna see the vaccine there. The reality is that that vaccine is a bounty and God has every right on the day of judgment to ask us, what did you do with that bounty and that gift that was given to you that was withheld from others? Because what you got was not just because you were born in a certain land and the other person wasn't, right? From a, from, a, from a strictly worldly view, that's what we'll consider. But from a divine point of view, you were given that for a reason. Now, did you let that blessing go to waste? Did you use it simply to satiate your own needs? Was it in any way helping you facilitate doing good for others? These are the questions that come to mind when we shift our viewpoint to every single thing in our moment to moment existence has been divinely decreed by God. And if we accept it as such, we recognize the blessing, understand the trust that comes with it, and then do what we can with it as we will be held accountable for it. Uh, I'll go ahead and end there. Jazakum uh, al I want to end uh, on a final point. Um, our beloved Dr. Amina, Amina Darwish, um, uh, subhanAllah, her father, uh, Muhammad Darwish, was actually just rushed to the ICU yesterday. Um, I believe he's in critical condition. Um, so Dr. Amina is currently uh, boarding a plane now for Turkey to go visit her father. So if you can keep him in your du'as, um, you know, we pray that Allah grants him a quick and speedy healing. He's relieved of any affliction or difficulty. This is a, uh, a, a trying time for a lot of us. Um, but our beloved Dr. Amina, we pray that, um, you know, her father is granted a quick healing. Um, you know, I asked her about him and she said, by far, he's the best man I've ever known. And so subhanAllah, that just speaks to, uh, you know, the status he has. Um, and so we pray that Allah preserves and protects him. All righty. Greetings, peace and blessings be upon you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa wala. Uh, we start in the name of God, with the name of God, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. We ask that he send his peace and his blessings upon our messenger, upon his companions, and upon all those who uh, follow in his path until the last day. Uh, so this is section 20, or just 20 of the Quran that we're going into today. Um, there are three surahs that we're going to be going through. We're going to be finishing up Surah Al-Naml, the chapter entitled The Ants, uh, completing all of, all of Surah Al-Qasas, uh, the stories, uh, and then beginning Surah Al-Ankabut, uh, which is uh, entitled The Spider. Uh, and so Surah Al-Nama I didn't really speak about yesterday, um, which we're going to be, we've already started, which is part of Juz 19. So I figured we'd talk a bit more about that. Uh, so Surah Al-Nama, uh, the ants is uh, this was a surah that was also revealed in Mecca. Shu'ara, Nam al Qasas, all three of these surahs were revealed uh, in the Meccan period, uh, in the sort of earlier phase uh, when the persecution was beginning to ramp up. Uh, there was some pressure from the Quraysh. Um, and so a lot of these uh, surahs are going to be speaking about previous stories, previous prophets, uh, examples of the past. Um, and the reason why this chapter is called The Ants is because it refers to a story regarding uh, the Prophet Suleiman or the Prophet Solomon, peace be upon him. Uh, and basically, Suleiman, he was a prophet that was granted the ability to uh, command uh, these large armies comprising not only uh, humans, but also animals. Um, and so in uh, verse 19, uh, there is basically sort of this exchange where there are uh, there's a sort of like hill of ants or a group of ants and they can hear the army of Suleiman coming forward. Um, and so the ants sort of start freaking out and tell the other ants to go back into their hole or into their ant hill. Um, and so Suleiman essentially, he, you know, laughs and he smiles and he, uh, you know, uh, marvels at the fact that he can decipher the fact that the ants are anxious, right? And that they have, um, you know, the sort of concern and care for each other. And so in that moment, he feels extremely grateful um, to have the privilege of understanding the ant's concern. And he actually makes this beautiful dua, uh, which we read in verse 19, uh, where he says, Rabbi ozirni an ashkru ni'mataka allati an'amta alayhi wa ala walidayhi. Uh, where he says, Lord, inspire me to be thankful for the blessings you have granted me and my parents 
and to do good deeds that please you. Admit me by your grace into the ranks of your righteous servants. Um, and I think it's incredibly uh, powerful that there is a dua made, a supplication made uh, to be given inspiration to be thankful. Um, I think there's a sort of rote type of thankfulness and gratitude we do, the kind of standard like we just kind of know, yeah, we should be grateful for our clothing, for our food, uh, which no doubt is important. But to be inspired to be grateful means to push beyond um, the sort of general surface level blessings that we kind of continue to refer to. Um, and so this is, a, you know, one of the, the, the many rabbanas, the, the du'as or supplications in the Quran, where we see from previous prophets, what were the things that they had asked God for? Um, and so along with this du'a of gratefulness, there's also this sort of consciousness of being gentle towards creation that uh, the prophet Solomon had an awareness of something as small as an ant and a group of ants and ensuring that their army was not uh, a source of pain or any sort of harm to them. Uh, and there's a hadith where Imam al-Qutubi, rahimahullah, he cites as part of the commentary in this verse, uh, where there was a, a prophet from the previous prophets who was once bitten by an ant. Uh, and as a result of being bitten by one ant, he then orders uh, that the entire ant hill be burned. Uh, and so God says to that prophet in response, did you, because a single, single ant had bit you, do you now wish to destroy an entire community from the communities that praise me, uh, that, um, that hymn the praises of me? Um, and so this is the, the Lord of mercy, uh, sort of demonstrating that gentleness that not only he has with creation, but then also what creation is meant to have towards other creation. Um, so this is uh, part of the story of Suleiman or Solomon, as is in this surah. Uh, at the very beginning of this juz, when we're going to start reading, you'll see there's a bunch of questions that are being posed. And these were the questions posed to the Quraysh. Uh, and you'll see along the lines questions like, who is it that created the heavens and the earth? Who made the earth a stable place to live? Who is it that answers the distressed when they call upon him? Who removes their su suffering? Who makes you successors in the earth? Um, and this sort of rapid fire questioning, uh, it, it's beautiful when you read it through the verses because it's question after question. And then at the end of each ayah, Allah Azza wa he says, Allah, is there, is there any God aside from, uh, from God himself who could provide these things? Um, so this was meant to really push the Quraysh to think on an intellectual level, like what other entity could be providing all these other, um, you know, things and be orchestrating all these other aspects of their reality. Uh, so this is the end of uh, Surah Al-Namal, and then we go into Surah Al-Qasas, the entirety of which is in Juz 20. Uh, this is the chapter entitled The Stories. Um, and in this surah, uh, this was also a Makkan surah, um, this, of course, focuses on stories of the past, primarily the story of Moses, uh, Musa a.s. Um, and I wanted to just focus on the beginning part of it. So the general arc of Moses' story is we know that, um, you know, he was born. Uh, his mother had to basically, you know, send him off to avoid him being killed. Uh, he goes and he ends up getting raised in the house of Pharaoh. He then ends up leaving uh, Pharaoh, the Pharaoh in Egypt spends several years out uh, as a Bedouin, as a shepherd, then comes back as a messenger, commanding Pharaoh to let his people go, the children of Israel. Um, and so this surah sort of details some of the nuance behind what was going on, especially in those uh, initial phases. And I want to focus specifically on the mother of Moses, the mother of Musa alayhi salam. Um, so we know that Pharaoh gets this dream that basically someone from amongst his people is going to overthrow him. And so he orders that all the newborn sons be killed, right? And so uh, the mother of Moses is commanded uh, upon having Musa alayhi salam that she has to give him up. Now, in giving him up, there's an ayah in here. This is verse 10, where Allah Azza wa says, the next day Moses' mother felt a void in her heart. If we had not strengthened it to make her one of those who believe, she would have revealed everything about him, right? She would have just divulge the fact that that was her son that she gave up, that she was now separated from him, that she had to do this and, and basically give him away. And so Ibn Kathir, he writes in the commentary of this ayah that uh, the nature of the grief of the mother was so intense that there was absolutely nothing else that occupied her heart outside of the fact that she was separated from her beloved, from her son. Um, and this is something where, you know, Ibn Kathir writes about this too, is uh, the, the feelings of grief and sorrow um, are extremely normal, especially when it comes to uh, uh, having those types of emotions while trying to fulfill 
uh, uh, or maintain alignment with the decree of God or, or what would be pleasing to God. Um, and in this case, right, it was Moses's mother who had to give him up as a commandment from God, but still feels very naturally that grief and sorrow. And it's something for us to also know that uh, those types of emotions are extremely normal, uh, especially in this journey of faith. One is not simply always uh, going to be, uh, you know, happy or joyous with the divine decree. You know, you think about the life of the prophet, uh, peace be upon him. Towards the end of his life, he had a third son, the first who had died in their infancy. He had a third son by the name of Ibrahim. And within just a couple years, that son also died and passed away. And here you have, again, the prophet burying essentially one of his infants, uh, you know, one of his newborns. Uh, and the companions, they, they saw him crying as a result of his son passing. They asked him, well, if this is the degree, decree of God, how could you be sorrow? You know, how could you be sad or sorrowful? Uh, and he says beautifully, he says, you know, the eyes shed tears and the heart grieves, uh, but the tongue only says that which is pleasing to God. So even in terms of the prophets and the pious predecessor, predecessors like the mother of Moses, in trying to align with the divine decree, the grief is still there, but they channel it in such a way where they remain uh, uh, they, 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 they keep that trust and knowing ultimately what God has promised for them is better uh, and will, you know, eventually uh, um, outweigh whatever grief is experienced in the moment. And so coming back to the story of the mother of Moses, you know, Allah Azza just says in a previous ayah in verse number seven that we inspired Moses' mother saying, suckle him. And then when you fear for his safety, put him in the river. Do not be afraid and do not grieve for we shall return him to you and make him a messenger. So it's important to understand that as much as the mother of Moses felt this intense uh, grief and sadness, she also had a complete trust in God to the point where she knew that if this is what, uh, you know, the divine has decreed and wants of me, uh, then I'm going to fulfill this obligation. The mother of Moses would never know that her son would end up going and being sent to the house of Fir'aun, uh, that the wife of Fir'aun, our beloved Asi, uh, his wife, um, you know, that she would be the one to receive him and want to like welcome him into that family. She would never know that there would be no other uh, uh, nursing mothers who would be able to nurse Moses and that she would eventually be reunited as is written in this chapter. She'd be reunited with Moses as one of the wet nurses uh, because as Allah writes in verse 12, we had ordained that Moses would refuse to feed from wet nurses. His sister approached them and said, shall I tell you about a household which could bring him up for you and take good care of him? And then Allah says in the next verse, we restored Moses to his mother in this way so that she might be comforted, not grieve, and know that God's promise is true. Uh, and so again, right, we take the stories of the past and especially uh, those who had these high stations with God to understand that they too felt this immense grief and anxiety and sorrow at certain points, but their conviction in knowing that the promise of God was true gave them the strength in the midst of that sorrow to trust that whatever was going to come their way uh, was going to be better when, than what they were experiencing in the moment. And that's why read is so often stated, as, as, as Allah says in the Quran, indeed with hardship comes ease. Uh, the trust has to be that that ease is going to come and that it will be there. Uh, uh, but the feelings of sorrow and grief are natural. And those should not be shunned or dismissed as having a sort of weakness in terms of faith, because those are parts of the human experience. Um, the, the last part of um, Surah Al-Qasas is a story regarding Qarun. Uh, and I think this is also an important story to share. Qarun was essentially someone who was fully loaded with a bunch of wealth, as Allah describes in this chapter, starting from verse 76. He had so much wealth that the keys to his treasures, the keys had to be lifted by several men uh, because the gates to his treasures or the doors to his treasures were that big. Um, and so the people say to Qarun, la Allah la yuhibbul farihin, that with all this wealth, they say to him, do not be exultant or do not exult. Indeed, Allah does not like those uh, who are excessively exultant or luxurious in that manner. And instead they provide this beautiful advice in the next ayah. They say to Qarun, but seek through that which God has given you the home of the hereafter. We talk plenty about doing what we can with the means, right? Or with the capacity and the, 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 the sort of, um, you know, circumstances that God has given us. Here they tell Qarun, seek through what God has given you, the home of the hereafter, and do not forget your share of the world and do good as Allah has done good to you and desire not corruption in the land 
Indeed, Allah does not like the corruptors. And so there's an acknowledgement here with regards to Arun's wealth is that uh, to seek through the wealth that he's been given, the home of the hereafter, meaning to do with it good, that benefits humanity is important. But also he's told, don't forget your share of this world, that to live a life that is comfortable, that is sustainable for you, for those around you, uh, that there's a part that you are entitled to as part of God's creation. And then he's told, do good as Allah has done good to you. And intrinsically in that is the reminder that for us to be cognizant of our capacity to give, we have to first center our hearts in knowing what is it that God has given to us? What are the ways in which we have been blessed? Because that then strengthens our ability to give that to other people. If we feel like we've only been cursed throughout our lives, then what motivation is there uh, to give of whatever we have? If we have that negative opinion uh, of our creator. And that's why Allah says in the Quran, وَإِن تَعَدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا that if you were to count or attempt to count the blessings of your Lord, they would be innumerable. And that ayah applies to every single person, right? We can compare our circumstances where things are different and no doubt some people more than others, but at the end of the day, there are inherent blessings that the heart can continue to be grateful for uh, if it really seeks and digs deep down. And it goes back to the first dua of Suleiman, where he prays and says, Ya Allah, inspire me to be grateful. Let the gratitude fully envelop my soul to the point where I can only feel, you know, that sense of uh, gratefulness for all that has been given to me. Um, the last surah, Surah Al-Ankabut, uh, this is the chapter uh, entitled The Spider. And this is named after verse 41, where Allah says, those who take protectors other than God can be compared to spiders building themselves houses. The spiders is the frailest of all houses, if only they could understand. Uh, and again, how many times do we see the creation of God and what we see in nature uh, as examples that help demonstrate uh, the lessons that are meant to be taught to us? Uh, in this case, thinking about what does it mean to build a house that has no foundation, no foundation of, uh, of faith or yaqeen or trust in God, no matter how much one then is able to accomplish in this life, if it is not rooted in some bigger purpose and something that exists beyond, uh, you know, the limited realities of this world, uh, then there'd be nothing to show for it at the end of the day. And it reminds you of the verse where Allah says, uh, you know, multiple times in the Quran that for those on the day of judgment, you know, the deeds that they simply accumulated in this life without purpose or direction, uh, they'll be as, as, um, you know, they'll have the weight or the value of dust, right? They'll essentially amount to nothing because uh, how we carry out ourselves, uh, there needs to be a direction and purpose behind it so that we see, right, that we're working towards something. There's progression, there's growth, there's advancement, not simply just from one stage to the next. We simply do what is there uh, or what we want. And, and there's nothing really at the end of the day that's being built or fortified within our hearts, uh, you know, and within our journeys in this world. So I'll go ahead and stop there. Uh, of course, again, uh, I ask you, inshallah, to make dua for Dr. Amina Darwish's uh, father, Muhammad Darwish, who's uh, in the ICU. Um, she's traveled abroad to go be with him. So we keep him our duas that Allah grants him a speedy and quick recovery and healing from whatever uh, affliction he may be enduring. Um, Jazakallah khair and all. If you would like to listen to more, please donate to www.icnyu.org slash donate. For more of our virtual programs, go to www.icnyu.org slash classes. If you have any questions, email us at info at icnyu.org.